I'm Rachel Goldsworthy and welcome to the Drive Home to Hawkesbury, where I believe every home has a story and I love sharing those stories on real estate in the Hawkesbury with you. Here we share the best ways to add value to your property, how to avoid the common mistakes people make when buying and selling property, and how to get the maximum return on your investment with a focus on supporting local business. I live, love Hawkesbury and can't wait to get into today's episode with you, so let's get started. Good morning, good afternoon or good evening, depending on what time you're tuning into the drive home to Hawkesbury. I'm Rachel Goldsworthy, local real estate agent for those that haven't met me or I haven't met you and I'm looking forward to that opportunity. But I'm also joined today by Catherine Hams. How are you, Catherine? I'm good, thank you, Rachel. It's a lovely day out there today. The um, temperature it's getting to, you wouldn't think it's winter, would you? I know. I was only thinking that over the weekend, actually. The temperatures we've been enjoying are almost like springtime versus Mm. autumn, which we're meant to be into, aren't we? That's right. I mean, this time you're usually getting your timber together so you can start making those fires for those who have those, you know, slow combustion fires inside. And uh, with the way we've been having that temperature, too warm. I know, exactly. Everybody's been talking about the fires, like you said. And interesting you say that too, because on the weekend I had a question from a a buyer and also from a tenant. Um, The question was around fireplaces and those sorts of things. And sometimes with leases, um, properties have fireplaces or combustions and they're not too sure as to whether to use them or not. So it's really important that as part of the lease that it's included on the lease that the fireplace is okay to use. Because some of the older fireplaces, you know, like those heritage houses um, that we have in and around the Hawkesbury, um, they do have fireplaces that have been blocked off because they've got such a narrow flue or they might have been blocked off for other reasons that it might be so wide up the top of the flue that there's a big draft coming through. So depending on what the the situation is there, we need to check before. And and this time of year, I think like you, uh, you've got an open fireplace or combustion fireplace, Mm. you would know that um, it's good to check whether those things are working before you stoke it with copious amounts of wood and create a bit of a situation at home with smoke and um, all sorts of other things. Yeah. And most definitely because I do know that with some of those older houses, like you're saying, that if they haven't been used for a while, that you really do need to sweep them because you can catch fire inside. And I don't know if this is correct or not, but some of those really old places, are they, were they not only coal based or something? So that they have different sort of fire mediums, I think it is, that you can use? Yes, it's a, it's an interesting topic, isn't it? And you've quite rightly said that, you know, the inside of the fireplaces can often have, say, for example, a bird's nest that's created, been created over mm. springtime. And if you mm. don't realise this and, you know, you don't get a chimney sweep in to clean the flue, do what you need to do, sweep it out, as you said, um, you mm. can create a lot of heat in the, the flu and that may create a fire. So it's really important for that maintenance on, an, on a regular basis. Mm-hmm. And it's like anything, isn't it, whether it's houses or whether it's people or whether it's life in general, if you keep up with that regular maintenance um, and you stay mm-hmm. on top of things, life flows a little mm-hmm. bit better. I think also um, people that have put insulation into their roof. Now, I had this happen with my own place where I've got a open and a slow combustion. And I had insulation put in the roof, making sure that I tried to, you know, do the good thing for the environment and everything like that. Well, the yeah. fellow that installed the insulation bats put it all nicely around the flue that went through, but you don't do that. And then the first fire we put in there, it actually burnt them, which then put a fire down into the ceiling and then melted the paint back and created the most interesting of smells in the place that took quite a few weeks to get rid of. So. Even with wow. people that have newly had things insulated and things, it wouldn't hurt just to pop up in the roof and just have a look around and make sure everything's okay because it's not an experience you'd want to have. No, that sounds dreadful. And I guess too, like you said, making sure you've got the right people on the job because if they're not yeah. qualified or if they're not familiar with mm. that style of house or that style mm. of insulation in and around particular products or materials, mm. it's really important to get it right. So once again, you know, engaging the right professional to yeah. do the right yeah. thing. So we do have contacts with chimney sweeps and those sorts of people and yeah, also okay. um, and people that insulate the roof. So if anybody needs any um you know referrals for that happy to put you in touch with the guys and girls that do that for it for us Mm -hmm. so um and with all this cooler weather but then beautiful weather at the same time I believe you've taken a a trip 
to visit your beautiful grandchildren? I have. I went up to the Hunter Valley about a week ago and yes. uh, my eldest daughter's got her child up there and uh, my lovely little granddaughter, Sydney, Sydney Rose, she is teething. So, of course, as soon as I walked in, it was, hello, mum, here's the baby, which was <laughs> wonderful. So um, yeah. it was great because it really, it just, uh, for everyone out there that's uh, had children and is going either into grandparenthood or what, like I am now, it's when you handed the baby, you don't go, oh, what do I do? It just comes back so quickly, so quickly. So, you know, thank God our mind is great and it stores what we need to store. Sometimes yes. it stores not very good stuff, but, you know, yeah. um, but that was great. But I think that, you know, um, young mums go through such a lot of uh, new things and mm. things that they haven't experienced. And to see your child crying and uncomfortable and not being able to help, and, of course, at that age they can't speak. So yeah. it, it's very, apart from being really hard for the child that's cutting those teeth, for the mother or the father it's also a really hard thing as well. And the grandparent, and the grandparent, don't forget the grandparent. But, um yeah. Look, my daughter tried cold things and, um, you know, a, an amber necklace that apparently my other daughter who's got a baby, she does that too. Uh, it's supposed right. to, the heat of the body is supposed to let off this um, acid that is got um, relieving properties for pain and okay. things. Uh, I, by the way that my granddaughter was screaming, I don't think it was working to its maximum that day. Um, but the other thing, you know, they've got a lot of other natural things they can do with chamomile and things like that. But, you know, at the end yeah. of the day, it's just what happens. Yeah, yeah. I think it's um, really important to, I guess, acknowledge too that when you're a young mum or dad, there isn't really, I mean, there's lots of resources out there, but you don't sort of read a book and go, okay, I've got this, I know exactly what I'm doing because mm. it's like anything in life. We're always learning, aren't we? We are in hands-on experience. I mean, no one, like, That's even, right. no one can tell you what to experience before you have a child, what it's going to be like, and every child's unique and different. And mm. so in some ways the books are great guides. And with the internet, I mean, like a lot of young mums and dads will be just, you know, Googling away on their phones. And that's really great. But the one thing I just want to put out there to everyone is to make sure the information you're getting is a really good quality information. Mm. You don't want to be going to a blog or something going, oh, well, I'll try that little bit of hocus mm. pocus mm. because mm. it's your child. So, mm. yeah, any information. Like Dr Google's great, but really always make sure your source is good. Yeah, no, absolutely. That's great advice. Um, mm. And what else has been going on for you, Catherine? Anything exciting? Um, well, you know, I've been doing my cooking as I always do and um, been sort of working on the broth situation of doing those. I'm going to put a few videos up and I want to cook as well, doing the broths with people and teaching them. And um, just teaching them actually, like I did a lot with my daughter when I was up there, the yeah, nutritional right. value yeah. in them, yeah. but yeah. also the it's cost effective. So coming into winter, wonderful time to do it. I love your broths. I think they're brilliant. Um, you gave me a few pointers on putting things together and what to put in there. And it's so simple. You put them in the slow cookers and away you go. So I'm looking forward mm. to seeing those videos on the broths and um, might be able to, um, you know, help out a few people. And also when you're, you're marketing a home, I mean, they talk about the baked bread and the coffee, but um, broths go a long way too because there's some great aromas coming through the house from that. Mm. So uh, yeah, really important to get that right. Gives the um, homely feel, doesn't it, Rachel? It, it does. I think it's really important to have that homely feel. It's mm. it's like with the feng shui of the house. It's a harmonious feel as you're walking through the house. You either walk into a house and go, oh, gee, this feels really good. I feel mm. great. I, I feel energetic. I feel, you know, and it, I can see myself living here. Whereas if you walk mm. into it and you think, oh, gee, look at that colour. Oh, gee, that, that furniture is out of place or things just aren't right to that person. Mm -hmm. And I think it's really important for the art of placement and uh, I guess the positioning of different things throughout the house that makes a big difference. The aromas throughout the house, um, it's back mm -hmm. to the senses, the basic things in life, the decluttering, all of that. Yeah. Um, and I'm happy to help out anybody in regards to the feng shui of the home or in regards to just general tips on how to maximise the return on your investment and how to get the most out of your investment. Because a lot of people, um, you know, it, it's hard out there trying to 
look after a family, look after the young ones and, and you know, go to work and childcare is so expensive. So the amount of money that you have left in the pay packet to spend on the house is minimal, I suppose, in comparison to some mm -hmm. other things. So they're low cost strategies that I employ to make sure you get that maximum bang on, on the house and just to make sure that it looks great and feels great because you want to come home to a nice environment. You want to come home mm. to a peaceful environment and you want to enjoy the space that you're in whilst you're living in that house, don't you? Well, you do. And I suppose what you've got with the home is you've got your memories and everything that you go to create. And we have such a big thing about the family home and everyone wanting to buy one that it's important to have that, as you say. And I mean, even like when selling, I mean, people are wanting to get the ultimate because they're moving on to either another scale house because their family's grown or something like that. And That's right. You know, it's it's so important to, I know when I first walked into the home I have that there was a smell in it that as soon as I walked in, I went, oh, this is my home. And I don't know what it is, but it was just something that did that. And yes. maybe that, and it's all our senses that we have. It's what we feel and, you know, with the Feng Shui and all that. It's very important that, um, you know, to have that declutter. And I know you've helped us out. And it, it's really, it, decluttering, I think, also declutters your mind as well. Yeah, but I think too, a lot of people, and you've lived there with your partner for quite a number of years at nearly. Oh, 16 years, maybe 17 years. Uh, I think that over time, we don't realise what we accumulate. We all do it. Mm. Um, mm. But I've been to some clients' homes where they just don't know where to begin. And I think that that's, mm. that's the hardest thing. But when you have somebody objectively come into your home, and it's, I guess that's the hardest call to make for somebody to put their hand up and say, you know, well, what's going on and, and how can I help? Um, but equally, it's just the basics, going back to the basics. And, um, you know, once once people start making the inroads with that, it's very easy to, you know, create the space that you want. And mm. you've been mm. really inspired lately in doing some great things around your place. You've been painting mm. and you've been creating mm. and mm. it just looks terrific. And mm. I think, um, you know, everybody... Uh, wants to do different things over the time with their homes and it's all positive mm. as you're moving towards the common goal. I think what happens though, Rachel, I know that with uh, my lot of five kids I've got that, <laughs> um, and as you write, I've been with my current partner for 17 years but I've been here for about 32 years and, I mean, 32 years of gathering children's belongings is an interesting thing and I'm sure there's a lot of parents out there that have either sheds or gar you know garages or rooms that have still got mm. piles and piles mm. of things and as a parent you don't want to throw them out but no. um, the children also don't want to take them but then you know they come back a few years later and they go oh, have you got this have you got that but yes. um, it's important it, it's a hard thing it's like cutting those apron ties that we have as parents with the children and getting to that point, I know for me that it was overwhelming, totally mm. overwhelming. And because I had Hashimoto's, I didn't need that extra pressure on me. But to no. walk around and to look at the house and all the things that were there and, and you just look and you think, how did I do this? How did I accumulate it? It's like mm. turning around and one day, bang, you've got clutter. And mm. the best thing for me has been clearing, sorting and and I think if that people have some rules, and not necessarily the rules I say now, but work out what works for you. That's what's going to be. But if it's like, I know I think what one of my children said recently when they were doing a wedding and they said, if we haven't spoken to them for two years, they're not coming to the wedding. Well, look, if you haven't looked at it for so many years or you haven't used it or you've forgotten <laughs> about it, that's well, right. do you need it? Get rid of it. You know, yeah, exactly. That's it. So, you know, um, goes. you've got to have some sort of, like boundaries and if you can keep that template in your mind and a mindset of how you can create that peace within by decluttering then you know good luck with it and go for it and you know what garage sales are great you get a bit of money too so <laughs> there you are no that's so true but I mean mm. how many people and and ourselves over the years you know you have guilt trips everywhere around the house whether it's that shirt that you bought 10 years ago that you probably mm. haven't worn or that dress that's sort of mm. been hanging in the, the the cupboard that somebody gave you and saying oh I really love that and I want to wear that but would I you know probably yeah. not and but you don't want to throw yeah. it out because somebody's taken that love and care to give that to you 
um, or it's cost a lot of money or whatever it might be, or the piece of furniture that your parents or your grandparents yeah. or your family members, you know, it's so such a difficult thing to analyse as to which is important to keep or which is not important to keep. And I think it's nice to have those things in and around your house that remind you of your family and your friends and the great, great things that you all did together. Mm. Um, but it's also the, you've got to be practical about what you keep because yeah. you can't keep everything, you know. And as you said, 32 years of, you know, which is the most, which is generally speaking, you know, anywhere between 15 and 30 years people have been staying in their houses in and around the Hawkesbury and I find that that's a pretty common timeline. So there's yeah. a lot of stuff that we all collect over that time. Yeah. yeah. And I think that when people are giving away, like have to get, things passed on like I know I have a piano of my mother's mm. huge item what do you do with it you know well I can't let it go because it's my mother and and I for that I mean that's where you need some sort of grief sort of to to part with that thing and mm. to look at it um with the emotions out of it and say mm. well okay I've had the piano for so long maybe it could go to someone else who could get enjoyment from it that's right and, yeah, yeah. So um, I, I think decluttering all that's a really good thing, but it's mm. um, certainly ha homes that have a lot of memories and talking mm. about a lot of memories with homes. You went to that um, talk during the week on Wednesday night about what they're doing up at Bilpin, didn't you? And you got a yes. lot of yes. interesting things from that? Yeah, look, it was a community meeting um, held by the Bells Line of Road um, Action Group and I will put a, a link up here as we speak so that everybody's got that there. But, um, yeah, it, it was it was an interesting talk. There was a lot of people there. There was a lot of emotion in and around what was said. And you can understand why because, um, you know, they're, they're homes that have been lived in for a long period of time. There's um, families that have got businesses that have been there and they're, they're reliant on the income from the produce from those farms um you know and also it's getting close to being gazetted so local council is having a meeting tomorrow again and i believe if you wanted to attend you can you just and if you wanted to say anything you can speak uh you can contact council and let them know before 3 p.m tomorrow that you wanted to um, have something to say or put forward your ideas from 6 30 the meeting starts but um I'm going to try and get uh, a couple of interviews, uh, one with uh, the Brookout group and also one with some local councillors just to get some different ideas as to where things are headed with this and what's actually going to happen as a result of it being gazetted, mm -hmm. um, if that does actually happen. But, um, you know, there's a lot of um, – it was emotionally charged and I think it was – it was a difficult night for a lot of people, but I think that the discussions need to be had so that we can all get mm. to the bottom of it and uh, work out um, what the best way forward is. And I think out of the 192 kilometres of corridor that the New South Wales Transport were putting forward, they suggested that that would change uh, because there is such a, a large amount as to what was going to change. Uh, there was some... Um, you know, questions around that and mm. also how the properties were going to be uh, taken over. So if they gazette it and they put that down for that particular area or that particular option, then those homes are earmarked and, you know, it was the flow on effect of sale value for people. What, you know, information was available, how that was going to be calculated, what sort of time frame it would take for these sorts of things to come into play. So, um, yeah, interesting to follow. But uh, once again, I'll put up the um, the website. If you go to their website, you can join it if you're a local person. And it is on Facebook. That's their, their group there. And, um, you know, a bit of information in and around. And, you know, whether you're for or against, it doesn't matter. It's just good to be aware of what's happening in your area um and good to have the discussions so that it is fair and, and equitable for all parties moving forward mm. and the trouble yeah. is with this sort of thing and it's happening a lot through sydney and other areas as well is that when people as you said get their homes affected or their businesses or you know mm. where we've just been talking about the family home in 32 years of memory mm. and things like that that you can mm. understand when going into a group like that there's a lot of emotionally charged people 
that um, are working off the fact that they're paid their taxes, they've paid their council rates, they've done everything they've thought. Mm. And even when purchasing their property, it was never, you know, the, the what had been written of where it was going to go. They trusted all that. Mm. And for their feelings, it's ripped out from under their feet. The problem is, though, that when you get a whole group of people together, and even though it's great to be united in your stance, that emotional charging tends to get knee-jerk reactions. And those reactions aren't actually positive, unfortunately. And sometimes it's good to get a solid sort of group of information and, you know, really sit down and try and nut it out with council and to go along to the meetings and really try to work positive for a really good outcome for everyone. Yeah, no, that's a really good point. I completely agree. I think, um, you know, it is an emotional time for people, but um, if you don't, go to the meetings or if you don't talk to councillors, if you don't speak to New South Wales Transport, if you don't get involved, your vote doesn't count basically. So, you know, uh, ultimately all feed in, get involved, find out what's yeah. going on in your local area and make a contribution if you wanted to do yeah. that um, and, and speak to the local councillors. They're very approachable, you know. Um, mm. Speak to New South Wales Transport um, speak to um, the Bell's Line of Road Action Group because they, the, everybody is open to discussion and I think that that's a good yeah. thing. However, you know, I guess it's it's come to a point where it's um, there's for and against and it's just trying to nut all that out. And as you said, Gath, it, it's, it's good to, to try and, and get to a common ground that, yeah. yes, you may not win all of the points from one side to the yeah. other, but at least there's some sort of compromise on both yeah. parties and hopefully we're able to get to that point where, um, you know, the majority are able to um, secure the best future yeah. for themselves and, and for the community. Yeah. And I think that when you say that about the councils that they're approachable and, you know, even your local members and things like that. Absolutely. Um, I think people have to remember that we're all people. We're just mm -hmm. people with jobs. That's it. And, mm -hmm. you know, they have to carry out the job they have to carry out to bring home the income for their families. So in the end, there are people and their families mm -hmm. and we're yeah. all living in the Hawkesbury. So, absolutely, you know, yeah. working yeah. together really is a great thing to do. Yeah, I completely agree. And, you know, as you say, they've all got families, they've got children as well, and they're, yeah. they're people. So whilst the anger may yeah. be directed at them, perhaps it should mm. be sort of direct, redirected to, um, you know, working out the best way forward rather exactly. than yeah. personal attacks on people because yeah. it's um, it's hard enough as it is, I would imagine, for them being in yeah. the public eye. But to be able to have a conversation with them, approach them and, and speak to them because yeah. they are human beings. They're just like all of us yeah. and they it's want the best right. way forward for their community yeah. too. And whether we're on the same side or not on the same side, it doesn't matter. At the end of the day, if you don't have the discussions, you'll never know. And uh, I think it's, yeah. it's, it's good to, to have those discussions and um, catch up with people as much as you possibly can and get involved. Yeah, and as you said, you know, working together, working hard at things is good. And from what I've heard from a little birdie and a puppy dog that you got there, that um, you've been nominated, was it, for the Women's Altitude Business Excellence Awards? Oh, thank you, Catherine. Yes, I, um, I, the team and myself have been nominated for the Business Excellence yeah. Awards and we really appreciate the nomination from everybody. I guess there's a lot of hard work of years um, slogging away at different things, but um, we want to feel as though we make a difference and um, to be recognised, we're very humbled for that. And there's a lot of great businesses out in the, the Hawkesbury and Nepean and abroad and in the mountains. And I applaud mm -hmm. everybody for the nominations and also the ones that weren't nominated. It doesn't matter. We're yeah. all in there together. And I sent, essentially that's one of the reasons why I set up the Drive Home to Hawkesbury too, is to reach out mm -hmm. to other local businesses because uh, sometimes, you know, it can be a lonely place, at, uh, you know, when you're working in that business and to have those other local businesses working together and, you know, mm -hmm. um, on the same page and to share ideas and thoughts and, 
uh, I know that that wasn't available to me when I first started business uh, years ago and uh, about 20 years ago. So I thought it was really important part of that. And it's just really nice to be nominated. There's some great sponsors um, for that event for women mm. with altitude, uh, Commonwealth Bank and um, yeah. Woodford Home Loans. And uh, there's some other great people that are involved with that, but also great local businesses too. And I'm very proud and humbled to, to be part of that process. And thank you for um, saying something. That's but, all right. Uh, so when does it actually happen, Rachel? I think we've got uh, a cocktail party on this week to announce okay. the nominations. So that should be yeah. um, a fun night, getting to catch up with everybody, networking, as they say, and, um, you know, just finding out what's going on for other businesses yeah. and, and how they're doing things better out there in the community. And where are they holding that? Uh, that's at the Commonwealth Bank, I believe, in at Penrith. So uh, okay. that should be good. Hi, Barry. How are you going? Um yeah, and um, yeah, that should be really good. And we're looking forward to catching up with everybody um, on the night. Mm. So, yeah. yeah. Well, that's good. And so you have the cocktail party and what comes after that? I think there's a gala ball uh, that will be held ah, coming up. So uh, <laughs> get the party dress on. and um, Yeah, that's and what I'm thinking. <laughs> <laughs> cocktail yeah, dresses, be. party dresses, <laughs> all of that and, and more. Yeah, no, it sounds like a great night out. And I think Women with Altitude is a terrific organisation. They've been doing this for yeah. quite a few years now and supporting yeah. the local businesses. And I think... Um, the more people realise that the more you do things together with people, the more we all achieve. And in essence, that's yeah. what I think is our business. You know, we, we can't do what we do without working cohesively with our community, with our staff. And um, we, we really appreciate the opportunity to do that. And I think that as, you know, I started as a solo practitioner. I had my two puppy dogs and one cat. Um, we lived and worked from home. And that was my yeah. office. And then we've yeah. grown the business from that to essentially um, six staff and or five staff and, um, you know, sign written vehicles and commercial premises yeah. and um, signs everywhere. And, and business is great, you know, rent roll and, and those sorts of things. Strata, we look after the sales, we look after. But more importantly, the, the community, I think, um, because that's a really – it's a big part of my life and a big part of being involved with that. And I think uh, women with altitude uh, do that very well. So uh, thank you very much to the team over there, um, Andrea, Stephanie, Erica, Christine, and everybody else that's involved with that. They've also got a men's component to that. So there's also a men's awards uh, night. Mm -hmm. So they don't miss out as well because some great guys in business too. Yeah. And um, it's nice to applaud um, everybody within the community. Yeah. yeah, and I think that, like you say, with um, the sign writing on cars, you know, I notice when I drive around that I see so many businesses and people getting out there and having a go. And I'd have to say that it, it really pumps me. It makes me feel good that we've got that attitude that, you know, get out and have a go. And, you know, they're young people too, some of them, that are like got these aspirations of yeah. X, Y, Z. And, and right. people like yourself, Rachel, that work your way up and to put the hard hours in and you get to where you do and then you get recognition it's what you give in a mentoring type to everyone else out there or young women that think oh I can't do this well you know you you stand there as a, a person saying well you can and I think that's really important and these awards are important to recognize you know the excellence in that sort of format but as you said too there's other people that may not get mentioned but they're down there and they're still working and they're still doing it. And I, I just think it's it's great to have that attitude in life of having a go and, you know, being able to stand up and say, well, look, it's possible. Yeah. No, thank you, Catherine. It's, um, it, it's a, a great experience and it's lots of fun to be involved with it. But it's also... Um, I'm in the trenches with everybody else. You know, I'm at the cold mm. face of the business. I certainly mm. don't ask anybody to do anything that I wouldn't be happy to do myself. Mm. So mm. I'm putting up signs. I'm putting out flyers. I've done lots of different things over the years. And, mm. um, you know, just it's it's all part and parcel of it. But, um, you know, I think having these online platforms as well to be able to say hello to everybody and, yes. you know, meet so, so many great people, you know, uh, tenants and landlords and, and owners and buyers, mm -hmm. 
they're all people like ourselves and we've all got unique situations and it's just a matter of finding out what it is that they need help with and how we can best help them achieve what they want to with their goals and aspirations in regards to their homes because mm -hmm. um, some people you know they're they're renting a home and they're so house proud and so mm -hmm. you know that they, they love mm -hmm. catching up with you and I love catching up with them you know and yeah. the same thing with owners and um, you know people that have strata it's all part and parcel of it and it's nice you get to meet their family you get to meet their partners you get to meet mm -hmm. the important people in their lives and you become part of the fabric of their life and I love that yeah. about my job I love being involved with uh, everybody in the community and and your mm. clients actually become your friends and that's a nice thing and you get a lot of mm. referrals from generations of family so I'm getting grandchildren now from people that have sold mm. um, you know from their children and their, their grandchildren so uh, you know giving my age away a little bit here but mm. um, you know certainly it's terrific to be involved in that process mm. and certainly makes me really excited. And, you know, I've got a question for you here because you say you get the grandchildren coming through now too. And you would have seen a lot of movement in house pricing over the years that you've been doing that. And I know because I have children that are trying to get into the market and it's yes. so hard. So, I mean, when we look at the prices of housing and what they have to put down as deposits and things like that, do you think that's on par with how it used to be? That even though cheaper the houses, the percentage is the same, or do you think it is really hard? And do you come across that a lot? Like that would have to pull on you to know that there's young people out there trying to break in, yet the prices are what they are. Look, it's a really good question, Catherine, and I think that the stats that we're looking at at the moment is 50% of the population currently are millennials. So what the, the median house price at the moment is just over a million dollars in Sydney, which seems really unaffordable. Uh, mm -hmm. However, the projections for the next 20, 30 years is that the median house price is going to move to 3.5 to 4 million. Uh, and the millennials obviously will grow and then we'll have a new, um, yep. a new group of people through. But it is all relative. You know, you look at the wage amount now versus 20 years ago. Uh, the first mm. house that I sold in the Hawkesbury was around about 100000 Now you just sort of think, well, why, why weren't people buying the streets out? You know, that's so cheap. Mm. But the, the wages weren't very much at all in comparison to yeah. that. So what the um, Asian countries have gone to, they've moved to a generational loan scenario so that whilst the um, house and land or those sorts of things, generally not land because there's not much of it over there now available, but um, they've moved to generational loans because nobody can afford to buy a home themselves. So mum and dad might buy the house, they'll start the loan, and then as the years go by, they'll pay down the loan to a certain amount, but then the kids will take over. The parents will still live with the the children however the yeah. loan is then taken over by the children and then so it goes down to the grandchildren and you might find three yeah. generations are living within that home which is such a nice thing to do they really care for their their family and their parents yeah. and which is it's important part of australian life and culture yeah. as well um, but i think that they do that really well and the generational loan then becomes more affordable or more achievable because it is sort of worn down over the time but yeah. um Certainly it is is difficult. You're, you're quite right, you know, with um, median house price in and around a million dollars. And, you know, it's where do people get that from? But I guess the best advice I could give in that regard is to start saving early, uh, put away that 10% that you can, but also get in touch with a financial advisor that can give you the right advice around the best strategies to you know, save the right amount of money or what sort of deposits you need for that house mm -hmm. because sometimes you can buy houses with, uh, you know, a smaller deposit. So instead of paying the 10% deposit down to a 5% deposit and that can often be varied prior to the uh, negotiations. So yeah. that's possible. But also you can yeah. buy properties with um, very little money down. So depending yeah. on what the, um, whether it's an option or whether it's something else that you're looking at, there's all strategies that can be tackled to help you secure that house. Yeah. I know that um, with my children that uh, I could 
help them out as a person owning a home with some sort of guarantor mm, to help mm, them get that bridge in. Mm, and I suppose that I don't know if a lot of probably people know about this, but I think different lending agencies have different requirements and things. But mm. I just, I, I suppose I thought of that because of what you said about the family home and like what we really are talking about that from starting today's interview with the chimney right down to, you know, <laughs> your excellence awards in what you've been doing, which has just been producing this wonderful um, atmosphere for people to be able to buy or rent places in to the point of actually people being able to do it and the young ones coming through and getting there now. Yeah, so, you know, I, I think it's 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 hard. Um, I, I do agree that it's all relevant to wages. It's probably because, and I'm older than you, and I'm looking at it and saying, well, you're right. I mean, the place I purchased was $75,000 and why didn't I buy up heaps either? Because $75,000 was a lot of money back then, you know? <laughs> It was, so, you know. I think um, my parents have told me a few stories about fourteen thousand dollars as one of the the first purchases that they made. So, you know, yeah. it it is. Um, and back then, that was really difficult to find that fourteen thousand dollars. And um, you know, you'd look at houses every weekend. You'd do the same thing, but instead of scouring the internet, you'd be scouring the newspaper. Instead yeah. of ringing on a mobile, you'd be ringing on a landline, or you yeah. know, you'd be sending a, a letter to somebody mm -hmm. very official. Um, to mm -hmm. to ask them that they wanted to have a look at the at the house on the weekend. So yeah. um, you know that, those sorts of things. Lots of things are changes, but I think that it's important to look at the alternatives because even though you may be a millennial and you may be struggling with how am I going to get this deposit? There is no way I'm going to afford a million dollars. There's just no way I'm ever getting into the property market. That's it. I'm going to live with mum and she's going to take care of everything for me. Mum and dad are just going to yeah, look after no, no. because. <laughs> Well, you know, you do hurt, you do a lot for your family and you do help yeah. to a certain extent. But there comes a time where we've all got to stand on our own two feet and we've got to, you know, go to the right people that can give you the advice. I'm happy to help out and work out a strategy with people in regards to what their, you know, strategy is for a home. Equally, yeah. I can put you in touch with the right financial people that can help you with that plan. It's not only just a home loan that you're looking at from a financial plan, but also people... A like big shout out to Sue Wingate. She's brilliant um, in at Windsor. She looks after lots of people, financial advice, the, the accountants that know exactly what they need to know to be able to get people heading in the right direction and how yeah. to, you know, maximise the return um, for your properties mm -hmm. and how to, to do it the best way. So there's mm -hmm. lots of alternatives and that's what I say to people. Don't, don't worry if you feel as though it's too overwhelming or you can't do it. Mm -hmm. There is a way around different things or a strategy that we can work out to head towards that. It might not be yesterday when you wanted to be in the house. It might not be today, but it might be in a couple of months that we work towards it or six months or 12 months, depending yeah. on what it is. Because even some things like whether you're a casual at, at your employment or whether you're part-time or whether you're full-time will all adjust the amount of money that you can borrow. Yeah. So. Whilst I'm not a financial advisor and I'm not giving any financial advice, I think it's important to understand the, the distinctions between that and to be able to refer on to the right people. And, and that's the yeah. same thing with what you do, Catherine, you know, like with your hypnotherapy mm -hmm. and naturopathy, it's important to, to have the right person to go to and trust and, and have that information on hand so that you, mm -hmm. you're able to get out to the community. So if somebody did want to get in touch with you, how would they do that, Catherine? Uh, well, they can call me on my mobile phone, 0408 411 865, or um, they can email me or there's a link probably somewhere we can put up for them if they want to my Facebook page. So, But, um, no, I think that's really good. You said they're about working towards a home. And while they work towards it with you, Rachel, I'll help them create their dreams. <laughs> Terrific. No, happy to help out. And for those that I haven't met or Catherine hasn't met, we're looking forward to catching up with you. Uh, I'm Rachel Goldsworthy yeah. and I can be contacted at the rachelgoldsworthy.com.au website or you can email me at rachel at rachelgoldsworthy.com.au or contact me on 0418 410-498. I'd be happy to help and I know Catherine would too in regards to hypnotherapy and naturopathy in the local area. So I think that's it from us and we'll catch up with everybody at 12 noon next week. Thank you very much for being online everybody. Big shout out to Barry, Joseph and we'll catch up with you again soon. Bye. Bye-bye.
thank you so much for taking time out listening to today's episode. If you have any questions on the process of buying, selling, leasing or strata management, please don't hesitate to reach out to me. Be sure to subscribe on iTunes and I'd really appreciate it if you could spread the word by liking and sharing this episode with your family and friends. I'm Rachel Goldsworthy and I look forward to catching up with you on the next episode of the Drive Home to Hawkesbury.